Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. So today we're moving on to tier 3, which doesn't contain that many vehicles, but I still managed to find a lot to say about them, so sorry if this one is a bit long. Also, I'm a tiny bit unwell at the moment, so sorry if the commentary sounds a bit off. Anyway, thanks a lot for being here, and as always, I really hope you enjoy. So, first off today, we have something quite familiar, the M4A2. This is the final regular 76mm Sherman in the tree, and for 4.0, it's still pretty good. Not much changes functionally in playstyle when compared to the previous variants, but it is effectively improved in every way. Actively, firepower does remain unchanged, but this version does get access to the T45 APCR round. It doesn't really have much applicability at the tier, as the M61 shot is still fantastic, but it's always worth taking a couple of rounds with you in case you meet a KV-1 or something similar outside of the effective range of the APHE. Mobility is slightly improved too. The engine has 10 extra horsepower, so it is slightly more mobile, but as the M4A2 has had an increase in weight, it doesn't really amount to much. It is a lot faster on roads though, although it does get an upgrade that makes it even heavier. This Sherman, as well as some of the later versions, gets add-on track armor. This increases the weight by around a ton, but does give the tank some extra protection. The track armor this version gets is pretty great. It covers parts of the frontal hull, the upper side armor, and most of the turret sides. Track armor gives 15 millimeters of effective extra protection. It will read 20 in the armor analysis, but it does have a lower modifier. So this can make the M4A2 pretty tanky. On top of this, it has the most effective hull model protection-wise as well. There's no blisters on the front of the hull and no rounding, so you can angle this thing in complete safety. Well, relative to what you're fighting, of course, but this is the most effectiveness you can get, really. The turret has the same layout as the previous M4, but it doesn't get the armor plate over the turret weak spot, so this version does have a slightly weaker turret, but it's still not really by much. The hull protection and track armor more than make up for it, which makes this Sherman, even at 4.0, pretty adept at what it can do. Like we mentioned at the start, the playstyle hasn't really changed at all from the previous version, so as to avoid retreading old ground, I would definitely watch the previous episode for more context on these tanks. The M4A2 can now see a few more tougher vehicles at the higher BRs though, like the SU-85M and captured KV-1C, so full up tiers can be a bit more dangerous this time around, although most match dynamics won't change too much. You can afford to be consistently aggressive in this Sherman, as long as you angle and have the add-on armor upgrade, you can luck your way through a lot of brawls at close range. If angled, the track armor can eat shots from the German 75 and Russian 76, although, as always, not constantly reliable, but it is still better all the same. You will be fighting tougher tanks, but as long as you keep to the core playstyle of the previous Shermans, this thing really can still work. Just make sure to keep the hull angled and use the stabilizer, and the M4A2 will still do great. Pros? Great firepower. Decent armor, fast reload, and versatile. And the cons? Suffers and uptiers. Verdict? I would get it. It doesn't really have a lineup as it's the only 4.0 tank in the tree, but if by this point you have the Chaffee M4 and M10, you can make a strong lineup here as these tanks will all still work. And as the M4A2 is rank 3, it can research some of the later tanks a bit more effectively. So, it's a strong spearhead into rank 3, and will help you research the next vehicle a bit quicker too. Next up, we have the first of the long-barreled Shermans. This is the M4A1 76W, which combines a few aspects of some of the previous Shermans while also bringing a lot of new assets to the table. Chiefly though, and hence the name, this Sherman is equipped with the 76mm M1 cannon, which really is fantastic. Ballistics-wise, this cannon is functionally identical to the M7 version found on the M10, with the same core ammo types. Although, this version now gets a smoke shell. It also has the same angles and traverse rates as the previous two Shermans, as well as the stabilizer, so the 76 version is just as reactive. The only firepower released drawback is the reload, which is 1.1 seconds longer than the reload on the 75s. You'll easily outpace the German long 75 and 88mm guns, and the Russian 85 as well, but the British 17-pounder and the shorter German 75 basically match your speed. So, the reload is about average. It doesn't hold the tank back in any way, but it's no longer a distinct advantage, which slightly hurts its ability to be aggressive. And so does the armor, which has regressed in effectiveness a bit too. 
We'll get to the mantle in a second, but the hull is back to the same style as the first M4A1 Sherman with the rounded corners. The front plate is increased in thickness to 63.5mm instead of the 508 on the first version, so it is slightly improved there, but it was the corners that really limited what it can do. Like the M4A2, it does get some extra protection on the size of the hull and turret, and nowhere else, which is a bit of a shame, as if you are getting shot flat in the side, you'd likely be dead anyway, tracks or no tracks. The mantlet though is pretty good. All 76 Shermans share an almost identical version of this mantlet. The base thickness is 88.9mm thick, but because of the angle it has around 100mm of constantly reliable armour and in some spots it's even stronger. The neck armour of the turret face extends upward behind the mantlet in a sort of brace, which adds around 60mm of extra armour in these spots. It might seem like a pretty tiny area that's protected, but because of volumetric shells it does work quite well meaning you can catch some rounds from 88 and 85mm guns from time to time, and the Russian 76 can't get through the mantlet anywhere, unless they're using APCR, which to be honest I've never had happen. This Sherman technically has the worst mobility though. It's essentially the same as the first M4A1 again, but with the track armour it does limit your acceleration, so this one's really not the fastest. You could consider not equipping the track armour when you unlock it for that extra nudge of speed, but it's up to you really. If you were to play the Sherman perfectly, the armour would never come into play, so the extra mobility would be a decent benefit. But it is easy to say that in a disconnected way, as there's not really any way to guarantee you won't get hit. The extra armour isn't as impressive as the M4A2, but it can still help. If you do angle the hull, the track armour can save you if it's hit, but this relies on your enemy not being very competent, which isn't very reliable, as how good your enemy is, is entirely out of your control. Personally, I do use the extra armour, but if you want the tiny boost to mobility, go for it. They both have tangible benefits. As for playstyle, you do have some options. You can still quite comfortably play this thing aggressively like the previous Shermans. The short stab is still great, and that coupled with the fast turret drive and fantastic gun make this thing really strong at close range but you commonly won't be able to take a hit from anything unless you get lucky. The previous Shermans could brawl very reliably at the tier. The armour really worked, but for this Sherman, the rounded hull, slightly worse mobility, and slightly longer reload make it a bit harder to pull off consistently. However, I don't want to dissuade you from playing this way entirely. Personally, I use the Sherman in the same way and get some pretty good results with it brawling most of the time. I just want to make the point that you likely won't be achieving the same consistent level of success you hopefully had with the earlier Shermans. But this Sherman does have another playstyle you can use, quite reliably actually. Because of the mantlet armour and the extra punch of the gun, this thing can snipe quite nicely, but really it will work well in any location that's hull down. You won't be immune from these positions, but it's far more reliable in terms of protection than the hull, and this is where you should aim to play if you aren't having the best time with this Sherman. You can utilise this sort of cover and ridge lines really well. The gun is still pretty reliable over distance and because of the stabiliser, making small movements to reposition won't cut into your reaction time, which is a pretty big advantage. This is probably the most reliable way to play the Sherman and stay alive. Of course depending on the position you pick, but it's a location like this that gives you the most advantages. Although, if you trust your reaction times and knowledge of enemy armour, this thing still makes for a fantastic brawler. But just don't expect to take that many hits. Pros, great firepower, good hull down protection, and versatile. And the cons, constant weak spots. Verdicts, I would absolutely get it. There aren't many vehicles this tier, so you sort of have to get this one, but even so, it's a great tank potentially. It is outclassed pretty quickly, but 4.7 does have a bit of a lineup, and in any case, will make for a nice backup for some of the later lineups too. So, it's a decent start for the 76 Shermans. Next up, we have the M4A2 76, which for the most part is fairly easy to explain. This is basically to the M4A1 76 what the M4A2 75 was to the M4A1 75. Mostly identical firepower and mobility, but more reliable armour. Because of the increased weight, this version is again slightly slow off-road, but the engine is a smidge more powerful, so from a static position, it's still decently reactive. Firepower is essentially identical. The hull armour is exactly the same as the M4A2, which is great, because it means no weak spots. You can angle the hull freely and pretty reliably. This version doesn't get any add-on track armour though, which is a bit of a shame, but not the end of the world. 
This extra hull protection, however, does bump this Sherman up to 5.3, which can be a little bit tricky for it. Although it's still an excellent tank, and might be my favourite tank in the game, or close to it anyway. That doesn't mean in any way that I think the tank is flawless, it's just one that I really enjoy using, as this vehicle almost hits peak versatility in that it has advantages everywhere pretty much. At close range, the angles of the armour combined with the great cannon, reactivity and stabiliser make it a truly great brawler. At long range, the cannon will still work great, and the hull down protection can keep you alive for a long time if you jink shots and find a good bit of cover. But these points do somewhat bring up a problem, and this problem is why I think a lot of people struggle with these Shermans. The issue, ultimately, is that they do basically nothing for you. The armour isn't effective if unangled, the mobility isn't useful if you push to the wrong locations and travel above the speed of the stabiliser, and the gun, while effective, often won't pen if you just fire centre mass or shoot without aiming. To make the Sherman work at its best, you need to have direct input regarding all aspects of its ability. It has good strength to every point of the tank trifecta, but not good enough to have the game do the work for you. And really, I think that's the problem, but thankfully, it's not a problem that can't be solved. By this point of using the Shermans, you should have a decent idea of how to angle and where to position yourself. From the previous M4A2, the perfect angle doesn't change, it has peak efficiency of pointing the corner towards the enemy. And this is probably the easiest aspect to master. If angled, you can sometimes bounce badly placed shots from 85 and 88mm guns. The hull is also pretty good at baiting shots from around corners if an enemy is watching you as well. For mobility, it's a bit more varied, in that you should be using the mobility in different ways on different maps. The Sherman's mobility does work offensively to an extent. You can't push with it expecting to flank the majority of the enemy team or beat them to vantage points. Analogous tanks like the Panther D and T-3485 are faster than you, so they will get deeper into the map quicker and potentially better spots faster than you. So the aim shouldn't be to beat these tanks. The aim should be getting to a location where you know you can counter them, be it a ridgeline, street corner, a defilade, whatever area of the map gives you good cover. I can't really be more specific than this, of course, as all maps are different. In any case though, make sure you're not in the open and stay around some cover. Your stabilizer is great, but if the enemy hits you first, that advantage doesn't matter. Jumping from cover to cover ensures a reasonable degree of safety. It keeps you concealed and protected. But most importantly, it lets you engage from a static position, meaning you'll be operating within the limit of your stabilizer, letting you push out, fire, and pull back in one fluid motion which limits the time you can be shot at. This is the key aspect I keep in mind while playing the Sherman, at least in terms of the mobility. Firepower is a bit of a different story and will take some time to really get the hang of it. Like we mentioned earlier, the gun is great and has huge one-shot potential, but you need to make sure the round gets through. So you do need to aim for weak spots on most of the common tanks. Vehicles like the Panther, Tiger, IS-1 can't just be clicked on most of the time. So I will go into these vehicles a bit. The IS-1 is probably the most simple. All you really need to avoid is the hull front if unangled. The turret cheeks and cupola are pretty reliable one-shots. You can punch through the lower plate if you're close enough, but the turret is always the best option if the tank is looking at you. For the Tiger, it mostly depends on the angle. Front on, you can cut through the front plate at over a thousand meters. If it angles though, it gets a bit harder. Unless at point blank range, the Tiger can angle in such a way that makes the hull immune from your gun. This is quite a rarity though, so don't expect to be in this position very much. A lot of it just comes down to practice. At some angles, you can punch through the front plate, and at others you will have to go for the lower side armour. The lower side armour is weaker than the upper side, so if you can see it, it is better to aim here. If you do have to hit the turret though, either go for the barrel or the optic. This is the spot to the right of the gun if you're facing it. It is a hard spot to hit, but it's a relatively reliable anchor point for your aim. If you're fighting the H1 model, the cupola is a very easy shot if the tank is angled, or well, unangled as well I guess. It's only 80mm thick and will set off your APHE fuse, generally crippling the turret. For the Panther, the hull is entirely immune from your cannon front on, but the side armour is incredibly weak. If the Panther is slightly angled, this is the shot to take, as it is usually a one-shot. If the angle is very tight, try going for the lower side plate again as it isn't angled like the upper side plate. For the turret, try to aim for the middlemost block of the mantlet. The back of the turret face extends partially behind the mantlet, and in these spots you can't get through. So try and aim next to the gun. Aim for either the viewports or the coaxial machine gun. Those again are quite good anchor points. 
You can also aim for the flat side of the turret as well, as it is only 100mm thick, although it is a pretty tough spot, so be careful with it. I could go over every vehicle here of course, but honestly I think that would be reductive. Despite the caution I presented here, there are still a lot of tanks that you can just point and click on, but not all of them, so it does really pay to know your enemy when taking out this Sherman. Culminating all of these aspects though, the Sherman is ultimately a king of versatility. It's outgunned by the Tiger, out-armoured by the Panther, and outmaneuvered by the T-34 sure, but in every situation, it has something about it that will always work. A lot of players look at the BR of the Sherman and compare it to other tanks that share it. The Tiger H1, the Panther D, IS-1, etc. But this is reductive as the implication is that these tanks are being compared against their dominant aspects and nothing else, and in their peak environment. Of course, at range, a Panther holds all the cards. If a Tiger is angled and on the move or hull down, it can be a really tough target to take out, etc. And people often turn to the Sherman and say, well, what is its dominant aspect and where is its peak location? And the reason why people often don't have an answer is exactly what makes it so effective. It's not limited to any of these aspects or locations. You can't pigeonhole a vehicle like this. In the famous words of Todd Howard, I'm a believer that players are good self-directors, and I think one thing that's good about video games is that they can direct their own experience. You can quite easily define the advantages of the Tiger and Panther, and the Sherman being what it is gives you all the tools you need to not play into their strengths. If you can use the map, keep angled, know where to shoot, and keep your stabilizer active, you will always have a card to play. Pros. Great firepower. Decent protection and versatile. And the cons? Unreliable armor. Verdict. The Sherman is possibly my favorite vehicle in the game, so you should absolutely get it. I appreciate that I've played into emotion a bit more than objectivity in the last paragraph, so don't expect a flawless time in the M4A2. But I can promise you that if you stick with it and develop your skills, you will see why I like this tank so much. Next up, we have our first heavy tank of this tier, and it's a bit unconventional. This is the M6A1, a vehicle that's a bit tricky to find a perfect place for. Firstly, let's go over the firepower. This thing is equipped with the same 76mm gun to the previous two Shermans, although it doesn't get smoke. It also, interestingly, comes with a coaxial 37mm gun. This fires the same ammunition as the late Stuart's, so it has around 80mm of pen at close range which isn't enough to tackle contemporary tanks from the front, but from the side it can sometimes save you if you need a quick follow-up shot. It's also pretty great at quickly double-tapping light vehicles as well, and of course both are stabilised in the same way as the previous tanks. So for 4.7, firepower is pretty good. The turret rotation speed is a little slower than the Sherman's by about 4 degrees, so it's not quite as good, but still potentially really effective. Mobility has positive and negative elements. The M6 has an 800 horsepower engine, which is pretty huge. It accelerates to speed faster than the Sherman's off-road, and can reach its max speed of 35 kph fairly easily once spaded. But because it's so heavy, it can't really react very well, which does bring us to the issue of armour. The M6 sadly inherits the frontal hull rounding of the M4A1. The corners slope, which means you can't angle to increase the potential armour thickness. Which is a shame, as the front armour this thing has isn't too great. The frontal portion of the hull is 82mm thick, corners included. The corners offer around 100mm of protection when positioned completely front on, which is okay. The hull front as well does have some sporadic sloping parts which can sometimes catch an unlucky shot, but the hull armour really isn't too reliable. The lower plate is around 100mm thick which is better, but it's almost entirely flat which makes it an easy pen regardless. The turret armour is better though, a fair bit better. The mantlet itself is made up of two rounded 50mm overlapping plates, so the thickness isn't bad in most spots. The edge of the mantlet though is 250mm thick. It's a small section of armour, but it does actually get hit a fair bit. Another advantage is the side armour of the turret, which is 82mm thick like the hull. This means you can angle the turret to some degree quite effectively. If you angle the turret towards the enemy with the side of 37s on, this thing suddenly becomes pretty strong. The 37 soaks up most of the shrapnel in the event a shot pens, but the side of the turret and the outside of the turret face can quite comfortably block 88, 85 and most similar guns, although they can still get through the mantlet if you do this, but it's unlikely to cripple your turret crew, only knock out the breaches. 
which is great, especially if you're hull down, because this does give you time to repair. This tank is actually quite analogous to the 76mm M4A1 in playstyle, really. Its armor is the most effective and reliable hull down, more so than the Sherman's actually, so this is a really strong position for it. At close range or long range, the armor has the potential to work pretty well here, and so does the gun. So, if you can find a spot that hides the hull and gives you a decent sight line, you're set really. Although, again, like the Sherman, you don't have to play this way. You can reasonably comfortably roll around like a traditional heavy tank, especially at its own BR. A lot of the weaker guns will commonly bounce on you, especially the Russian guns, so this is still a reliable way to play. It takes a bit of luck, but this playstyle is probably the one that gets me the most success, just because I see more enemies. It might not be the fastest vehicle, but it does accelerate well, and most of the time will keep the stabilizer within the operational range. So rolling around like this will definitely work, if you can fire quickly and have a decent helping of luck. Try to keep the armor layout in mind while you play, and use it similarly to the M4A1, especially with corner peeking. You can angle ever so slightly though, not really because it increases the armor by that much, but it's more of a suggestion to the enemy if that makes sense. If you angle ever so slightly towards the right side, the twin machine gun point on the hull becomes central to the enemy's eyeline, and with the mentality most average players have, they'll shoot for the middle. This spot isn't the strongest, but it is the strongest spot you have. It can offer around 100 to 120 millimeters of reliable protection, which is decent. It does of course make the corner of the hull weaker slightly, but not really weak enough to the point where an enemy that couldn't get through the hull frontally could get through if it was angled. So you're not effectively dooming yourself angling like this. Again though, don't angle too much, only very slightly. Pros. Great firepower. Good hull down protection decent mobility, and versatile. And the cons? Unreliable armor. Verdict? I'd get it. Because of the gun, it will always have the potential to work within the BR range, even if the armor doesn't. At the right BR, you can play the heavy tank role well, but otherwise you're just a slightly chubbier Sherman, which isn't really such a bad thing. It can also make for a decent backup in the higher tiers as well, if you need it. So next up, we have a very interesting vehicle, the M4A3 E2 Jumbo. Another of my all-time favorite tanks, for good reason. In the arrangement of the tank itself, it's very visually similar to the Sherman, but the armor is improved substantially, and by far is this tank's most impressive asset. The armor requires a lot of discussion, I think, so we'll go over firepower and mobility first. The firepower is what people most commonly dislike about the Jumbo. This thing is equipped with the 75mm M3 cannon, which was first seen technically at 2.7, and at 5.3, and commonly 6.3, it's not going to be as effective. Regarding the particulars, firepower is identical to the M4A2. Same round, same rotation speed, same reload. Mobility isn't too bad either. It's of course heavier, but has a 500 horsepower engine, making its reactivity and acceleration pretty good. It, like the M6, can reach its top speed of 35 kph off-road pretty quickly once spaded. It doesn't really have a lot of speed potential, but it works for what the Jumbo is. It doesn't really hurt its ability to function in its role. The armor though is of course the most important aspect here, and getting to grips with the armor layout is a key factor to finding success with the Jumbo. Usually I don't like methodically going over all the armor values of tanks, as you guys can do that for yourself at your own pace, but I will cover this one a bit more than usual. The front plate is made up of two layers, the standard Sherman 63.5mm plate with a 38mm plate stacked on top. This might not seem like much, but if you angle, your hull front becomes almost immune from the Tiger, Panther, the Russian 85, and everything else underneath this. The only guns that consistently pose a threat to you are the Long 88, the 122, and the British and Swedish Sabo, and of course all of the 150mm plus guns. The turret is similarly well protected with 177mm of cast armor forming the mantlet, and 152mm protecting the rest of the turret, sides and back included. It is cast armor though, so it's slightly less effective than what the number will tell you, but it's still really strong. The side armor is tricky though. The upper side is made up of 76mm, and the lower side 38, which can get overmatched quite easily, and it's nailing this angle that makes or breaks the jumbo. If you angle only slightly more than you need to, a lot of tanks can just cut right through, especially the Russian guns with their incredibly generous slope modifier. This is the most reliable weak spot the Jumbo has, second only to the MG port. The armor thickness of the MG port varies a lot, but on average it offers around 60mm of protection, 
enough for almost all contemporary vehicles to get through. But it is a hard shot, especially if you angle away and keep on the move, which is absolutely core to the playstyle. The Jumbo's role is not really very similar to other heavy tanks. If you want to be pedantic, the Jumbo is an assault tank, not a heavy tank, but that derivation doesn't really matter here. I see a lot of people try and make a direct comparison between the Jumbo and the Tiger, and from my perspective it's a bad comparison to make, as these tanks function to almost polar opposite strengths. The Tiger gets stronger the further away it is from an enemy, and the Jumbo gets weaker the further away it is from an enemy. I guess this subject isn't entirely relevant for a guide on how to use the Jumbo, but to set up the playstyle properly I want to disconnect it from its contemporaries, because, like the M4A2, people look at the BR and make the same assumption that the Jumbo is, on all levels, equal to the Tiger. And just to clarify here, Gaijin have stated many times in the past that just because two vehicles share a BR, it doesn't mean that by sharing the BR, they're deemed equal. It just means that they're deemed equally capable of fighting the vehicles of other nations within that BR range. I'm not here to defend the BR of every vehicle that doesn't fit that notion, but for all intents and purposes, that is the intention of the system. The Jumbo was phenomenal at 5.0, and it's still good at 5.3, and just to reiterate again, it is nothing like the Tiger, despite them both being heavy tanks at the same BR. Like I mentioned before, the Jumbo gets stronger the closer it is to an enemy, and that's a good starting point for the playstyle. The gun can't snipe much at 5.3 and above. If you're angled and over a thousand meters away from an enemy, sure, they probably won't get through you, but you have even less chance. Mid-range as well is not ideal, but workable, if you know all the right weak spots and defensively manoeuvre, you can still knock out some tough targets, but close range is really where you want to be. At mid-range, sure, your armour is more effective, but generally, anything that can get through you easily at close range can get through you easily at mid-range. So all it really does is limit the effectiveness of your gun. This range, though, will keep your weak spots more protected, however, that's undeniable, but at the BRs you'll commonly be fighting at, you need to be close to make the gun work as a priority. This thing can meet the Tiger 2P and Jagdpanther, tanks that you can't reliably disable at range. So this is one of the rare cases where being closer with the heavy tank is actually better. A lot of combat in the Jumbo starts with a decision that you need to make when encountering an enemy, whether your first shot should aim to kill or disable. And it's knowing your enemy and correctly employing the right choice that will keep you alive the longest. Some tanks you can easily knock out frontally, some you can't. So it's mostly about assessing risk and choosing the appropriate action. This is a pretentious way of saying, should you shoot the barrel or not, which is quite a common part of gameplay with the Jumbo. A lot of tanks you won't struggle much with, Panzer IVs, other Shermans, KVs, T-34s, etc. If your positioning is good, these tanks can be free kills, but it's tanks like the Tiger and Panther that you need to be worried about. The way I approach these tanks is mostly always the same. Fire the main gun into the barrel and then 50 cal the track. 50 cals are incredibly underutilized against disabling tank tracks, and they can do it very quickly. So this way, you can disable a tank's ability to fire and move in effectively the same shot. From here, you can either flank or pick off weak spots from the front, whichever is more applicable in the given situation. This lets you deal with almost all threats safely, and as well, thankfully, German tanks especially have large muzzle brakes, making it an easier shot at close range, which makes this process an incredibly reliable way to dispatch these tanks. And with your stabilizer, you can do this pretty quickly as well, not giving the enemy a chance to react to you. And this is also why close range is such a good advantage, because to make the jumbo work competently against almost all enemies, you need to play within a range that you're comfortably able to land these barrel shots. So by following this method, tigers and panthers etc. can be dealt with. From the front, you'll mostly need APCR for the panthers. You can get through with the APHE at point blank, but it is often unreliable. The APCR can get right through the mantle if need be. For the Tiger 1, you can easily disable the Capola with APHE. This will usually cripple the turret crew. And then you can just use APCR to knock out the crew in the hull. You will as well need APCR for the Tiger E2, as the Capola can't really be penetrated with APHE. The Jumbo might be one of the most reliable brawling tanks in the entire game. It has the reload, armor, and reactivity to be adequately aggressive most of the time, but it definitely works best on maps with short sightlines. A jumbo out in the open isn't much of a threat. This thing works best when really aggressively pushing the enemy as it doesn't give them much time to work out how to deal with you, which will usually rush the enemy into making a poorly aimed shot, which gives you enough time to disable them. Try and avoid maps where you'll have to cross open ground, or could potentially be attacked from lots of different angles. If an enemy has even a slight angle on your lower side armor, 
they can one-shot you quite easily, so you do need to make sure that you're pointing the front part of your hull towards where most enemies will likely be. And this is by far the easiest to do on urban and small maps, as it keeps enemies close and limits the sightlines available for them to hit you, which is where the jumbo is in its absolute element. You can though run the flanking routes with this thing too. It's not the fastest, sure, but the enemies you'll meet on these pathways likely won't be expecting a jumbo, and this can really throw them off guard. They're used to encountering light vehicles most of the time, and as vehicles flanking are usually travelling at top speed, your shortstop stabiliser can really dispatch them quickly. And if you successfully manage to flank, you'll probably end up on the side of a lot of tigers and panthers, which are pretty easy shots. Of course, this is very map dependent, but in any case, the jumbo isn't limited to head-on brawling. You might need to be cautious about up tiers though. You can bounce long 88s with some luck, but it's hardly reliable to brawl against them. So if you have to play the jumbo at 6-3, bring some smokes. If you meet a tank you can't counter, MG the track and fire a smoke shell at them. This will usually give you a decent opportunity to escape and reposition. In any case though, always try and be conscious of your hull position, as even weak tanks can get through it from the side. It's well worth practicing this yourself in the penetration analysis to get a better idea, and once you nail it, the jumbo can really be a lot of fun. Pros. Great armor. Decent mobility. Fast reload and versatile. The cons, prominent weak spots, and suffers and up tiers. Verdict? Definitely get it. It's not going to be consistent fun at the start, but once you play the jumbo a lot, you can really have fun with it. It does what it does really well. And additionally, there is a 5.3 lineup you can make, so if you're on a map that doesn't quite support the jumbo's playstyle, you can always take the M4A2 instead. Next up is our only SPA this tier, the M19A1, a far cry in design from the M16. The M19 is based on the chassis of the Chaffee and equipped with twin 40mm Bofors cannons, which is a step up in firepower, but functionally it isn't exactly outstanding. Mobility is pretty good, it's almost identical to the Chaffee, but as the M19 is slightly lighter, it's a tad faster, though not by much. In any case, the M19 can run around the map if need be though. Protection-wise, it's not really anything special. It does have six crew, but they're not very well protected. Enemy tanks can use machine guns to take them out fairly easily. It's also very vulnerable to ammo racking. Before the last update, the ammo boxes didn't have any armor protection at all, but they are now protected by 4mm of steel, which is better than nothing, but still not that great. Aircraft will still be able to pop this thing pretty easily. So the M19 in general is pretty vulnerable. It's also quite large too, so it's relatively easy to hit. The firepower in theory is pretty okay. It's equipped with the twin 40mm cannons that can fire AP and HE. The AP round is pretty good, it can get through 72mm at point blank, which is enough to get through the side of most enemy vehicles around this BR. It's also pretty great at destroying light tanks too. The HE similarly will cripple a plane if the shot connects, but these cannons aren't the easiest to aim, they fire quite slowly as well at only 120 shots per minute. So if you're not too familiar with anti-air vehicles, this one might be a bit hard. I know I personally struggle to land shots if I haven't played this thing for a while. So getting the lead down can be a bit of a challenge, but all you can really do is keep practicing, there's no real secret trick to landing shots more accurately. Although, like we said in the first episode, try aiming twice as far as you think you need to. This mindset helps me at least if I'm struggling with the lead. There isn't really too much else to it for going after aircraft. Just try to stay behind cover and keep your eyes open for new planes. This thing again is pretty weak, so you really can't let them strafe you. Despite its pen, the M19 isn't that great at tank hunting. It's just too large and weak to fight reliably. Even if you barrel an enemy tank, they can still use the MGs to strip out your crew. So, while it's certainly possible, it's not exactly reliable. Personally, I have much more success playing this thing late game in the anti-tank role. There are usually more lightly armoured vehicles around, and the heavier tanks around the map are usually more spread out, which does make them easier to pick off. Early game, there's just too high a chance to run into something tough frontally. And as well, there's usually a lot more artillery being dropped. At 4-3, this thing can work as a first spawn, but anything higher than that, and it will struggle to perform on most maps. The M19 can work pretty okay in urban environments, the maps that offer plenty of alternate paths and flanking routes into the map itself, as you really want to avoid meeting enemies head on or sitting in open ground. You're far too vulnerable in these situations to fight reliably. Open maps with wide sightlines like Jungle and Sinai aren't really that suitable for this thing. 
so try and stay out of sight and flank if the map allows. For disabling tanks, it's best to take a similar approach to the jumbo. Go for the barrel, tracks, and then flank to the side. If the enemy has a machine gun, try and knock it out too. They can be tough to hit, especially the coax MGs, but it really will save you some crew if you knock these out. Pros. Decent anti-air ability. Decent anti-tank ability. And good mobility. And the cons. Very poor survivability. Verdict. I would get it, but this one was close. It offers a lot more anti-tank potential than the M16 this tier, and that alone, I think, makes it worth getting for the lineup. But it is a lot harder to get the hang of. And getting the hang of SPA can take a while, because most likely you won't be using SPA all the time in favour of actual tanks. The M16, even at this tier, works well. 50 cals will never not be effective against aircraft, and they're much easier to learn, so I'd probably wager that most players would do better with the M16. It's easier, but has less potential at the BR. If the extra anti-tank ability seems interesting to you, I would get the M19, as it ultimately can do more, objectively speaking. But if you aren't too fussed about SPA in general, and only play it rarely, and primarily in its intended role, the M16 will still do fine. So lastly, for the tech tree vehicles today, we have the M18 Hellcat. Very much a fan favourite tank, and very different to basically all of the vehicles we've seen so far. The M18 is an incredibly mobile light tank equipped with the 76mm cannon, and that's really the fundamentals of it. Firepower is essentially the same as all other examples with a few differences. Turret rotation speed and gun depression are the same. The only real difference is a 0.3 second longer reload for some reason, even though it's open top and the ammo is stored right by the gun. And it does also get a new APCR round. Not immensely impressive, I don't think I've ever used it on the M18, but it is there I guess. Although I wouldn't really recommend using it over the APHE, unless you're point blank to a KTH for whatever reason, so maybe take a few shots just for the sake of it, but you'll probably most likely rarely need to use them. The final change is the sight. The Hellcat only has a times 3 zoom instead of the 5 times on the 76 Shermans, so it might take a while to adjust between them. Armour is predictably non-existent. The entirety of the hull and turret sides are made up of 12.7mm of armour, with the mantlet being 25. This thing is vulnerable to everything. Aircraft, anti-air, machine guns, you name it really. So to counter this, you'll need to play out of sight and really avoid getting hit. And thankfully, the mobility accommodates this fully. With a 400 horsepower engine combined with only being 17 tons, this thing really gets around. It can reach over 70 kph on roads and can cruise at just over 40 kph off-road and 23 in reverse. So it's incredibly reactive and quick to accelerate, making the Hellcat a very strong threat potentially. So it would be pretty easy for me to just say flank and be done with it regarding playstyle, but there is more to it than that. The M18 does have its nuances. The core of the playstyle does absolutely revolve around flanking, but just hitting the side roads alone isn't really enough to keep this thing consistent. It's incredibly quick, but you still need to use that speed well. There's a very common trap that mobility catches players in, and it's very prevalent with the Hellcat as well. For a lot of tanks, it's easy to just hold W into the map until you meet an enemy. From there, especially with tanks like the Sherman, you can engage them and have a good shot at knocking them out, but that doesn't work for the Hellcat. And if you're conditioned to playing slower vehicles so far, you might find you just turn your brain off while driving out of the spawn, and turn it back on when you run into an enemy. And the Hellcat can't really operate like this. The Hellcat isn't stabilised and has a very bouncy gun if you're running at high speed, as well as poor armour. So if you run into an enemy head-on at full speed, it's likely they can hit you first, especially as they won't really need to aim. They can hit you anywhere and you're pretty much done, so you need to get the jump on the enemy. There are a few ways to get this jump though, and the main thing is to aim to use your mobility to reach a specific location rather than just push as far as you can until you see an enemy. The Hellcat can outpace almost anything, so you can comfortably reach a sniping spot with cover or a position to ambush enemies before they'll reach you. Maybe you'll be waiting 20, even 30 seconds before seeing anyone from this spot, but it will keep you alive and give you the first shot, which is really important for this thing. You need to leave the spawn with a plan. Map knowledge helps immensely for this, and it will really be instrumental to your success while playing the M18. All maps are different, so I can't really say go here, go there, generally as it's a cluttered way of explaining things. Try and push to a location that gives you a lot of cover for sniping, or try and park yourself alongside a route that most enemies will take to the cap. 
Of course, this is very vague and not all enemies will take this route, but it can be a good idea to just draw a line in your head from the spawn to the cap. Adjust for obstacles and assume the bulk of the enemy team will take this line, or at least around the line. It's not always going to work, absolutely, but it's a good foundation if you're struggling with the maps and don't really know where to put yourself. This is what I do when I try and learn a new map that comes out, and it works decently well as a starting point. In any case, you need to try and stay hidden while you move around the map. You've kind of got to be like Bigfoot. Your presence is felt, but not directly observed. You have the mobility to stay out of sight most of the time, and you should constantly be aiming to do this. You are incredibly vulnerable out in the open, so you should always intend to stay out of the direct line of sight behind some sort of cover. You can't risk being caught out in this thing, so you need to either wait for an enemy to run into your sight line from a static position, or jump out and surprise them when they're not looking at you. At low speed, your gun can be kind of stable, so like the Shermans, you can drive out, fire and pull back quite quickly, but it does take a bit of practice. It's also important to reposition yourself as well if you know an enemy is aware from you, predominantly if you've knocked them out and they're potentially coming back in the plane. You have a 50 cal, but you're incredibly weak from the air, so if you annoy a player enough, they are coming back and they are coming for you. So always keep this in mind and don't stay in the same spot for too long. You're at your strongest when you take enemies by surprise. As soon as they know where you are, you lose a lot of advantage. Another point with this is that the Hellcat is usually a poor late game spawn. Enemies on the ground are in less predictable positions and you are very vulnerable to all aircraft. And the easiest thing to spot from the air is movement. So if you're using your mobility as you should and are zipping around the map, you'll likely get spotted and strafed out. So the Hellcat works best as an early spawn and in up tiers as well. If the Shermans aren't cutting it, this thing can still hit the flanks. In War Thunder, mobility is never useless. It's why vehicles like the Locust and Puma are commonly seen well above their BR. Mobility can't be reliably countered, so you should always be using it. There's no point not pushing into the map with this thing. If you just sit at the back near the spawn and snipe, you should have just taken the Sherman. So only take this thing out if you intend to do something with it that the Shermans can't do. Otherwise, you're putting yourself at a bit of a disadvantage. So this progressive ambush type playstyle is what I'd aim to do. You can of course push the hardest flank and end up behind the enemy team, which is really fun and can net you a lot of kills, but it is less reliable and not suitable for all maps. On large maps that aren't enclosed like Arden and Fulda, you can do this much more reliably, but on enclosed maps like Corellia or Carpathians, it's much less reliable. The widest flanking route on these maps is predictable, whereas on Arden or Fulda, you have much more options because the flanks are wider and more varied. On these styles of maps, I would recommend pushing the hard flank as it can be really rewarding, but on enclosed maps, pushing hard and waiting in ambush is the more reliable play. Pros, great firepower, great mobility, and works in up tiers. And the cons? Terrible survivability. Verdict? Absolutely get it. This thing is a perfect lineup tank. As in up tiers where the armor and firepower of your other tanks aren't as effective, the mobility the Hellcat offers will still work. This tank can do things no other tank you have access to can, so it's a really important vehicle to pick up. And once you start mastering maps, this thing will treat you very well. First, for our premium tanks this tier, we have something quite unique and sadly unobtainable at the moment. This is the T55E1. This was one of the rewards for Season 2 of the Battle Pass and wasn't released as a coupon, so there's currently no way to get it. The T55E1 is equipped with the 76mm cannon, a fast reload, and a pretty great top speed, easily being able to reach 50 kph off road and the same in reverse. It is incredibly weak though, only having 6mm of steel protecting the crew and even then their heads poke out of the top so they're very vulnerable. It also has quite poor directional mobility as well, being a wheeled vehicle. The gun doesn't slew very far to the side so you'll commonly need to reposition while covering a sightline which will lose you a lot of time, time you can't really afford to lose given how vulnerable it is. The T55 is great for rushing in hyper aggressively and getting a few kills but it doesn't quite have much longevity in the match, but it can be pretty fun to catch enemies off guard with it. As of this BR, the US doesn't really have a vehicle that plays like this, so it is a nice tank to own. Maybe it will come around again in the future in one of the boxes on the marketplace, but as this was only very recently released, it likely won't be back for a fairly long time. Next up, we have the Calliope, a very famous and expensive premium. This thing uses the base model of the M4 Sherman with the addition of a rocket rack filled with M8 HE rockets. 
These rockets can get through 24mm of armor, which isn't that great, but they do work very well against light targets and if landed low down on the turret of regular vehicles. Apart from the rockets, the Calliope is largely the same as the M4. Although the Calliope doesn't have a variable zoom sight, it's locked at times 3 which can make aiming a bit tricky if you're very familiar with the other versions. This thing can be very fun and a little clubby at times as the rockets can strip off tracks and barrels very quickly, but you should probably never buy this thing as it's incredibly expensive at 9740 GE, which is what you'd be looking to pay for a top tier premium. It does have a lot of use and does make a 4.0 lineup more viable, but even though fun is relative, and maybe you'd be happy to pay this much for a tier 3 premium that offers a unique advantage like this, but you can invest that money in much better ways on talismans and later premiums. Even at half price, it's still a bit too expensive, but if you can get a lucky discount at 75% out of the trophies, then it might actually be worth getting. Regardless, it is a lot of fun, and it's pretty useful too, but you do have many more effective options this tier. Next up, we have the T-20, a once phenomenal tank brought down a bit by its BR changes. If the original dev server BR is included, this thing has gone from 4.3 to 6.0, making it, I believe, the tank with the highest BR in rank 3, which isn't really deserved if you ask me. This thing is equipped with the 76mm cannon, pretty great mobility and decent armour for a medium tank, and in general is much better than the Sherman. It's much faster than them and can even go 18 in reverse, which is great especially coming from a medium. It also has a much smaller profile than the Sherman and works great hull down due to the relatively tiny turret. Functionally though, it's not as reliable as it was back in the day. 6.0 for a tank that doesn't quite have enough armor and only a 75 is steep and it will struggle against a lot of the competition. Because of the mobility and versatility, it can still have some pretty impressive moments, but for a premium and a product, you're going to want reliability. This thing to a degree is pretty BR dependent, and that's out of your control. You'll find yourself in situations where the tank is at a fairly big disadvantage, due to no fault of your own. For 3850 G, it just doesn't quite cut it anymore. With good shot placement and map knowledge, you can still definitely make this thing work, but it's just not reliable enough to be a consistent grinder anymore, unfortunately. It does have a lineup though, and it isn't useless, so if you ever get a discount for it, it might be worth getting, but not at full price. Unless you're really confident with the gun and your knowledge of the maps. Next up, we have the T14 Heavy Tank. It's a bit of an analogue to the Jumbo, but at a lower BR. Firepower is identical, 75mm M3, smoke, APCR, all the normal stuff. Mobility is very similar to the Jumbo as well. They hit a similar speed off-road, although the T14 is slightly faster. It gets interesting with the armor though. The front hull is only 50mm thick, but at a very steep angle. The side armor is 50mm too, and slightly sloped, with the lower side armor being 63mm thick, with some extra plates on top. If you angle the hull, it becomes almost entirely immune from the German 75, Russian 57, and 76, and as well all similar guns. You can even bounce the 88 and 85 sometimes if you're lucky and angle well. The turret is pretty well protected too, with around 130mm on the mantlet effectively and 88 on the turret face. The side of the turret is even stronger though at 101mm of cast armour, which means you can even angle the turret if you want to. At 4.7, this thing still does incredibly well. At 5.7, not so much. From the front, it's much less reliable than the Jumbo against higher caliber guns, but it can angle really effectively, making it pretty reliably aggressive. If an enemy is attacking from an angle, you do have a decent chance to tank the shot. Like the Jumbo, however, it's not great on some maps, and as well does suffer a bit in up tiers. But it does have a pretty great lineup, with the M4A1 and M6A1. And those tanks work where the T14 doesn't, so it does have a lot of ability. It's also pretty cheap for a tier 3 premium at only 1750 GE, which makes this thing a really strong buy in my opinion. I don't always like recommending premiums that are BR dependent, but with the T14, it does have the potential to be so effective at its own BR that it makes it worth it. You'll bounce a lot of shells and the gun is still workable so it doesn't struggle to get kills. And on those maps that don't suit the T14, you have some other good tanks to take some of the pressure off. So this really is one that I do recommend. Its main issue as a product is longevity, as at the end of its own BR range it becomes a bit redundant. You can sometimes bounce shots, but it won't be fair to say that's reliable. 
but for the price, it is a really strong tank. If you prefer slower, well-armoured vehicles, this one will suit you well, I think. So ultimately, I do recommend it. It's not a tank for everyone, but the price and the performance are easily worth it. It plays a lot like the M4 or M4A275. So if you enjoyed playing those tanks getting to this point, you'll likely enjoy this one too. But as always, only buy it if you have the money. It's definitely not a requirement. So next up, we have the M18 Black Cat. Apart from a few visual differences, this thing is functionally identical to the regular M18 in the regular tech tree. It gets some extra decals and loses the muzzle brake and the side mudguards. This isn't enough to change its weight though, so it's basically the same. To be extremely contrarian, you could say that the Black Cat is slightly worse because the muzzle brake on the regular M18 could take a hit sometimes, saving you from dying. So yeah, but that's going to happen maybe once every 50 games, so it's barely worth considering. In some ways, I quite like cloned premiums like this. They don't lock a playstyle behind a paywall, which is nice, but at the same time, they are devalued a little bit because you could, for much cheaper, get a talisman on the regular version in the tree. For example, the Black Cat costs 2,980 GE, whereas a talisman on the regular version is only 1,200 GE. Granted, it doesn't get a Silver Lion boost though. Because this tank is identical, I wouldn't say it would ever be a necessity to buy it. It doesn't enhance your gameplay in any way from a functional perspective, and it's a more expensive alternative if you just want RP. Although, it's still a Hellcat, which means it'll work well beyond its own BR, which is a really strong advantage for a premium. It's the antithesis to the T14 in that sense. If you're really familiar with the game and the maps, you'll probably get your money's worth out of this thing, but in general, it's not necessary and isn't really the most consistently reliable vehicle to use either. So I'd only really get this one if you truly love the M18 or light tank playstyles in general. And lastly today, we have the Cobra King, which as a product is very, very similar to the previous M18. It's again an exact copy and at the same price, 2,980 GE. And basically the exact same principles of necessity apply here too. It's still a very functional vehicle, but doesn't really offer anything new. I think for the average player, this would be a better pick than the Hellcat, just because it's much more forgiving. You can bounce a ton of shots in the jumbo and still get a lot of points and RP while doing it. It's also much harder to misplay, relatively speaking. I still think the T14 offers more at a lower price, but two jumbos at 5.3 can be pretty strong on the right map and BR. Also, the Cobra King has a much higher Lion modifier, at 420% compared to the 340 on the Hellcat and 330 on the T14. So it is good for SL. Back in the day, I'd play the Cobra King a lot with friends and I'd pretty much always end up with a few million SL after a fairly long session. So really, it's up to you on this one. If you get it on discount, I would say pick it up for sure, if you enjoy the gameplay 5.3 has to offer. But like the others, not a necessity. Plus, you can always just talisman the regular jumbo instead. First for our CAS aircraft today, we have a pretty unorthodox example, the P61C1 Black Widow. This is a pretty heavy aircraft, but it can still do some work. It comes equipped with a quad defensive turret of 50 cals and four frontal facing 20mm guns. And the US 20s are really quite good. They have a max pen of 30 at 100 meters, and they're really capable of ripping through the top of a lot of enemy armor. It can also carry four 1,000 pound bombs with three drops. The outward pair drop together, and the middle pair drop separately, which is pretty nice. It doesn't have a dive bomb sight though, so the bombs are pretty hard to lead, but overall, once you get the hang of it, the P61 can be pretty decent. It's a relatively unwieldy, but still effective air defense fighter. And even without the spawn points for the bombs, the 20s with ground targets can still work. It's a big target, but not bad for 4.0. Also at 4.0, you could take out the SB2C4. This one is folded with the previous SB2C, but for combined battles, it's pretty good. It's highly maneuverable with keyboard controls and comes with two frontal 20mm cannons, the same type as the P61. It has a decent loadout of two 500 pound bombs and a single 1000, or a naval mine if you prefer. After dropping its bombs, this thing can function loosely as a fighter, which makes it quite versatile. And as it's classed as a bomber, it comes with a separate spawn point pool, so you can take it out alongside fighter casts with no penalty at all. Next up, we have one of the most established CAS aircraft ever, really, the P-47D. You could go for the Razorback version, which is the first P-47 variant in the tree, but it's not quite as good. This section is mainly relating to the P-47D25 and 28, the versions with the bubble canopy. 
They're quite similar in performance, but the D28 is slightly better, but at a higher BR. Offensively, they're functionally identical though, so just for ease I'll talk about them as if they're one single vehicle. The P47 comes with 850 cals with the late war belts, which are really strong against air and ground targets. Its max load is 10 HVAR rockets and 3 bombs, two 1000s and 1500 with the 1000s dropping in pairs. You can also carry either of these loadouts separately if you're not interested in rockets or vice versa. The P47 works well beyond its BR and has the speed to perform the maneuvers it needs to pretty easily. It's not much of a dogfighter, but with decent flap management, you can beat some fighters in the air with a bit of practice. Either way, this one is a must-have. Next up is the P51 D5. In terms of CAS, it's weaker than the P47, but it's much more capable as a fighter, being much easier to fly. It comes equipped with a max of 6 HVARs and two 500 pound bombs with one drop, so it still isn't bad. It has the late war belts too, so it does decent damage against aircraft. The P47 is ultimately better for CAS, but if you would prefer a more reliable fighter, this Mustang will do just fine for the time being. Next up, we have the A26B. There are two here to choose from, and we start with the B10. The B10 can carry four internal 1,000 pound bombs, or 10 500 pound bombs, with four on the wings. It can also equip twin 37 mm cannons with some nice AP belts, getting through 60 mm of armor at 500 meters. These guns don't do that much damage though in my experience. They also fire quite slowly, and because the A26 isn't intensely maneuverable, it can be hard to get good angles for these guns to work. This is an upgrade though, and stock, it comes with six frontal 50 cals. Next is the B50. This one is folded after the B10, and comes with 14 frontal 50 cals along the wings and in the nose which makes strafing out light vehicles and aircraft head-ons really easy. It can also carry the same load of four 1,000 pound bombs with separate drops. But it doesn't get the 10 500s, only six in the bomb bay, which is still pretty good. Personally, I prefer the B-50. The 14 50 cals have a lot of flexibility, and it also does get wet too. The A-26 is also a very fast and rugged aircraft. Despite its sleek looks, it can take a lot of punishment. It also has twin remote controlled 50 cal turrets, which cover some really wide angles, which makes it pretty well defended overall. It's a great grinder in Air RB2 if you pop a talisman on it, so I would really recommend one of these. And finally, and briefly, we have a PlayStation exclusive, the A26C 45DT. This one has eight frontal 50 cals and a similar bomb load to the B10 version. The only difference is the DT can carry HVAR rockets and two 1000 pound bombs. It's also only $20, which is a really, really good buy for combined battles or just for grinding with in general. There's also an identical version for PC without the rocket capability, which is what I'm using in these clips. This one is a very rare event vehicle now. It sometimes comes around for big celebrations, but it's very rare and isn't a premium either. Either way though, if you're on PS4 or PS5, this one is pretty good. So there we are guys, that's everything for today. On the screen now are the best lineups I think you can make using vehicles from rank 3 and below. I haven't made one with the Hellcat here as the Hellcat's not really a good vehicle to base an entire lineup around if you don't have any other 5.7s, as that thing works in up tiers anyway so it's not worth weakening the advantages of the lower tier tanks to bring up with it. So I'll include some lineups with the Hellcat next time. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry it's really, really long. I don't really know how I managed to write so much about those tech tree vehicles. I think they're just sort of I guess on the surface they are quite simple, but uh, from my perspective there's a lot that goes into them, at least I think. Uh, maybe I'm completely wrong, I don't know, but uh, hopefully uh, the information included there is uh, kind of useful, hopefully it helps you out uh, going through the tree. And uh, next we have tier 4, which is substantially larger uh, than tier 3, so hopefully I can kind of blitz through that as well. Um, hopefully. Uh, the vehicles in tier 3, excuse me, in tier 4 are... Uh, very different as well, like I think every vehicle pretty much plays quite differently. So yeah, that's going to be uh, probably another really long video, uh, apologies for that in advance. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, sorry if my voice has been a bit scruffy, uh, I'm not feeling too great at the moment and I've had to record this over two days, uh, so hopefully it's uh, listenable and it doesn't sound too bad. Uh, anyway, it should be all fine for the next one. So yeah, thanks as always for getting this far, I uh, really hope you enjoyed the video. And um, yeah, I guess that's everything. I hope you have a lovely day and I will see you next time.